Well, it's an understatement to introduce Deepak Chopra as a best-selling writer, although he is the author of more than 55 books on health, success, spirituality, books that have been translated into dozens of languages and that have sold, sold millions of copies around the globe. But that only hits at the cultural impact Deepak Chopra uh, has had in North America since he moved to the United States from his native New Delhi a few decades ago to pursue a career in medicine. After embarking on a spiritual journey of his own, he left behind his job as a hospital chief of staff and founded the Chopra Center for Well-Being in La Jolla, California. From that home base, he's gone on to become one of the foremost champions of alternative medicine and Eastern wisdom in Western popular culture today. The last time he visited Q, Deepak Chopra had just published Jesus, a story of enlightenment, a fictional imagining of Christ's so-called lost years. That book was a companion to his previous work about Buddha. And now the trilogy has been completed with the publication of his newest work, Muhammad, a story of the last prophet, and Deepak Chopra joins me once again live in Studio Q. Hello, sir. Thanks for having me. It's very yeah. nice to have you here. Always you, nice to be on the you, show. You're, you're running out of profits. You, well, you, I you, thought you, I'd what? at least do the superstars. <laughs> it's going to be bad <laughs> for business. You, where do you go next? You, Jesus, Buddha, Muhammad. Uh, Deepak, from the World, the World Trade uh, Center mosque controversy uh, most recently to the Quran burning threat uh, on the 9-11 anniversary, Islam seems to be at the center of national conversation in America right now. It's an interesting time for your novel about the life of Muhammad to come out, don't you think? It is. It wasn't planned that way, but synchronistically it did happen that way. Tell me, I mentioned this as part of a trilogy, coming after Buddha mm -hmm. and Jesus, both of whom might be religious founding f uh, figures whose life stories many uh, are more fami familiar with than Muhammad's. How much did you know about the life of Muhammad when you started this book? I grew up with lots of Muslim friends in India, so I knew a little bit. But then for two years, I literally lived Muhammad in my consciousness, read about him, read about all the characters in his life, saw their reactions. So the book, when I finally decided to do it, came through these different voices, people who reacted to him, in his time. Unlike the other two, you know, Jesus claimed that he was son of God. Buddha claimed that he was enlightened. Muhammad uh, was surprised when he first heard the angel Gabriel say to him, recite in the name of the Lord, who created uh, human life from congealed drops of blood, recite in the name of the ever bountiful who teaches by the pen, who will reveal to you what has never been revealed to mankind before. So here's this very ordinary, shy, diffident person with no ambition, and suddenly, and he's, to boot, he's illiterate. He doesn't know how to read and right, write. Right. And then what comes out of him is the Holy Quran, revealed truth. I mean, it's astonishing that an ordinary person who has no inclination to be a prophet suddenly starts to recite this. Now, you okay, know, well, I... Let me take two mm, steps back, mm, first of all. When you, because we'll, we'll work through this. Mm, There's a lot, you've said a lot there. Uh, you lived in Muhammad's consciousness for a couple of years. Yeah. What does that mean? It means I read the history, then I go into incubation, and then I emerge in my own mind as someone in his life that I know about now, but I try to look at the world through their eyes, feel the world through their eyes. But you are still being Deepak Chopra. You're oh, yeah. doing appearances, you're uh, um, writing other books, you're doing, so you, you could do that and, and be in the consciousness of Muhammad? <laughs> yes, yeah, 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 I can do that. Um, you know, really? I, I, have, I have this practice of meditation, uh, which is um, to evoke archetypes in my own consciousness. So I can, you know, I do that with Greek mythical figures, Aphrodite or Zeus or whatever. It's the only way to get a feel for for that personality is to actually invoke the energy, the archetypal energy in your own consciousness. When you say you look at the history, where do you go to study Muhammad? I mean, besides well, the Quran. There are many uh, historical biographies by Indian uh, authors. There are historical biographies by Muslim scholars. There's, of course, the latest Karen Armstrong uh, biography. Um, they are very factual and very, um, very historical. But um, I decided to take another route. I decided to actually 
create a story that would give you a real feel of what was happening. You know, Muhammad's story is a story of adventure. It's also a story of politics, of uh, persecution, of war. Everything that happens in uh, in uh, a person's life, but also happens in the life of society. Let me start with a broader question, mm-hmm. and this might seem naive, but given that Islam is one of the world's uh, great and most uh, biggest religions, and fastest it, growing, the fastest growing, that it affects millions and millions and millions of people around the world. Why don't we know more about Islam and Muhammad in the West? Because we are very self-centered, uh, egocentric, and uh, when we don't know, and I can give you the actual statistics because I, I'm a senior scientist at Gallup where we did polls. We polled 10 Muslim countries, um, uh, the equivalent of over a billion Muslims and their opinions, and we also polled Americans. 65% of Americans know nothing, nothing about either Islam or Muhammad, and yet, if they are asked, do they trust Islam? They say no. So, you know, when you don't know someone, you demonize them in your head, and then it's easy to be violent. You know, yesterday, by the way, I saw something really shocking on CNN. American soldiers in Afghanistan killing innocent civilians for sport. I was so absolutely shocked at this abysmal behavior by American troops that comes from treating other people as non-humans. When you said the study was done in 10 uh, Muslim Islam. countries, uh, Islamic countries, and then in the United States, what, what did they find in the Islamic countries? I mean, Very interesting. They were asked, what do you admire most about the West? And they said freedom of speech, entrepreneurship, um, uh, the fact that people can say anything that they want. And what did they dislike about the West was the lack of respect for other people outside their own domain lack of respect for elderly people, lack of caring for the elderly, things like that, lack of charity. It was very revealing. And what's interesting, uh, however, to put you at the center of all this, is that you uh, were born into, grew up in the East, mm-hmm. uh, in New Delhi, but not necessarily, in terms of your extended family and your grandparents, with an affection for Islam or Muhammad, right? That was because I grew up in the aftermath of the uh, bloodshed that occurred when India was divided into Pakistan and India. So we lost a lot of relatives in the genocide. So my grandparents were obviously very prejudiced against Muslims. On the other hand, my father constantly reminded me that Hindus had also killed Muslims, and they had been as violent as the Muslims had been. The only difference was they were vegetarians. (laughs) So, you know, I see that human uh, nature can be diabolical under certain conditions, and we all have a dark side. Do you remember your earliest recognition of of prejudice? My grandmother. She would uh, go take a shower if if a Muslim shadow crossed her. She would literally take a shower? Literally take a shower. To clean her, cleanse herself? To cleanse herself. And, and know, when did you realize that that was wrong or that you didn't agree with that? Um, very early because my father would always apologize for her. <laughs> he loved his mother, but he would always apologize for her behavior. So I learned that very early. And then, of course, you know, my school was, uh, the, the school I went to was very uh, interesting in that we had all kinds of people, Zora- Zoroastrians, Muslims, Christians, Catholics, Protestants, Jews, Hindus, Buddhists, and we thought religion was always something to celebrate because I went to all the great festivals, Eid and you know things like that. <laughs> When we talk about the antagonistic climate that Muslims face today in the West, in the West and in the U.S. especially, it seems to be worse right now than it has been, uh, even immediately after 9-11. How much did recent history weigh on your mind when you set out to tell this story from centuries ago? It did weigh on my mind. I also wanted, you know, I've always been mystified myself by the awe of revelation And unlike the other prophets, you know, Muhammad said, I'm a man amongst men. Everything that uh, is good comes from God. 
everything that's not so good, I'll take the responsibility for. So I saw him as a great leader, and I said, you know, why is this religion so successful, and why is it also so misunderstood? So recent events did weigh on my mind, yes. And obviously, Muhammad can be a controversial figure for a writer or an artist to take up. People from uh, Danish cartoonists to Salman Rushdie have met mm. with violent consequences after using the figure or the image of Muhammad mm. in their work. Is that something that gave you pause when you set out to do this book? You know, if I was really concerned about that, it would have been impossible for me to write the book. I wanted to write the book factually, with respect, um, without being an apologist, because I did see some of the official biographies are apologist biographies. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to be factual. And beyond that, I can't control people's reaction. But the book is written with respect. And if you read the book, you will have more empathy for Islam than when you started out. For sure. But you do wade into this stuff uh, with with great confidence. It's 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 remarkable that you, I mean, that you don't, this isn't a completely flattering portrait of Muhammad, the man. He, we see him ordering the execution of Jews, taking a six-year-old bride. Uh, did you worry at all about doing a warts and all profile of, of, of the prophet or that you might just be wrong? See, I, I, I'm not wrong for sure. Those are facts. <laughs> I'm not judging or condoning or condemning or justifying what happened across the abyss of time in a different culture. You know, uh, marriage with uh, with at that age was common in those times. Aisha, in fact, was betrothed to somebody else before she married um, um, uh, Muhammad. It was uh, usually to forge in those days um, tribal alliances and also to continue lineages. It was common not only in the Middle East, but also in the Far East and in medieval times, even in Europe. So, you know, it's easy to point out fingers at one particular figure when we don't know the context, the historical context, the cultural context. But if it's so important to get the historical context and to tell the historical story, why a fictionalized account? Why do you, but does, th does that not blur the lines? There is a genre of literature called historical fiction. It's well known, it's very popular. It's the way to tell facts through an interesting story. And, you know, I like when I see journalists, usually they, they are interested in some of the facts. They're never interested in the truth, but they always love a good story. So Journalists in, are never interested in the truth? Not in it's the whole truth. It's a sweeping statement, Deepak Chopra? It's my experience anyway. <laughs> you know, but, they but like you know, some of the facts, but they always love a good but story. It gives you a device, though, too, doesn't it? To sort of say, if, if anybody disagrees at some point, you say, well, it's fiction. I wrote a fiction book. The book has been seen by Muslim scholars, and so far nobody has objected, in the, except, you know, I used the word massacre, and the objection was it was not a massacre, it was an execution. So I'm willing to change that. But otherwise, nobody has really found fault with any of the facts in the book. Something you mentioned about Muhammad again and again, uh, and that you've said a couple of times here today, unlike other founders of major religions, he was a very ordinary person, a man among men, you say. Uh, and then he's therefore easy for us to relate to. Why is that an important message about who Muhammad was? Because he relates to our humanity. You know, we all can relate to um, him as a person. Uh, Jesus is too exalted, and Buddha is from a different dimension. Muhammad is like us, with contradictions, with paradoxes, uh, with divine revelation, with the awe of divine re revelation, and surrounded by the burden of violence, which is exactly what's happening today. You don't subscribe to any particular organized religion, correct? I don't, no. But you do say in this book that I can't. I can't remember the exact uh, what you how, how you put it exactly, but that Muhammad works for you somehow better than other prophets. Yeah, because he's uh, straightforward. Uh, he um, gives you straightforward rules to abide by the five pillars of Islam, and um, he gives you a promise. And why, for the sake of it, are you not uh, subscribing to an organ? I mean, wh why not be a Muslim, for example? I think organized religion becomes. Um, you know what I think of organized religion, any religion, it's just a cult with a large following. They have dogma, they have ideology, they're exclusive, and they become divisive, quarrelsome, and ultimately idiotic. <laughs> and people couldn't say that about the Chopra Center? No. The Chopra Center opens itself up to dialogue. It's not exclusive. It offers scholarships to the indigent. 
It's always exploring. I've always believed that you should seek the company of those who are looking for the truth and run away from those who found it. Uh, let me ask you while I have you here. I, I want to mention another piece of writing that you've published this month, a short critique of Stephen Hawking's new book, in which he argues that there's no need to invoke God to explain the universe. Do you think questioning God is too risky in our volatile world? Is, is, it is, but you know, my, my take on Stephen Hawking is that um, he's theologically naive. He's a very smart scientist, and what he calls the nothing, you know, he made a statement, the universe can and will continue to create itself out of nothing because of a law called gravity. And um, I am now actually in the process of writing a book with uh, Leonard Melodinow, who's the co-author of Grand Design, Stephen Hawking's design um, and book. So we're working together now to, to do a book called War of the Worlds. Will science or spirituality steal the future? Because neither science is going away nor is spirituality going away. Are we going to have this endless war or can we find a revealed truth through both disciplines. But when Stephen Hawking writes something like that, isn't that good fodder for, or for that matter, Christopher Hitchens writing that God is not great? Doesn't that start a conversation that we need to have in this world? It does, but it's talking about a God that's a dead white male that doesn't need to be killed anymore. He was killed by Laplace, then he was killed by um, Richard Dawkins. He keeps getting killed over and over again. How many times can you kill somebody who's already dead? <laughs> so uh, I, I take it you believe in God, but he's not a dead white male. He's not a dead white male, and he's not a he. I mean, God is the consciousness of which the universe is an emergent property. It's a possibility field from where space-time energy information and the world of objects emerges. And when you really understand the mystery that you cannot be solved, actually, ultimately, that in itself is awe-inspiring and gives you a feeling of reverence. Perhaps you need another name. Yeah, Perhaps, because, because, yeah, God uh, is a Lord. God is that, yeah, it's yeah. so confusing. And yet, you know, when you look at all these religions, they come from a religious experience that is one of transcendence, that is one of interconnectedness of being and life and existence, and one of um, certain attributes that emerge from that experience, what are called platonic values, truth, goodness, beauty, harmony, and also attitudes of loving kindness, compassion, joy, equanimity, peace of mind, security. Deepak, you started out as a doctor mm -hmm. and a practitioner of alternative medicine, helping individuals one-on-one. -on -one. Do you see your role as larger now, as someone, are you someone who seeks to make an impact on bigger societal issues like the situation of Muslims in the West? Yes, I see myself as um, a doctor who wants to be more than a doctor, a healer. So I started off trying to understand healing in the physical body, then emotional healing, and then spiritual healing. And now I see that, you know, healing is has to encompass the ecosystem, has to encompass social justice, has to address poverty, has to address um, uh, the inequities that are in our world. So healing has to include all of the above. The word healing, by the way, means wholeness. So healing, holy, and wholeness are the same word. You're healing right. is the return of the memory of Wholeness. You're prolific. You're ubiquitous in, in popular culture. Uh, would you self-identify as an ambitious person, Deepak Chopra? No, I agree with Oscar Wilde that driving ambition is the last refuge of the failure. And uh, I've never, you know, I go with the flow. I, I, uh, <laughs> yeah. I Well, the flow <laughs> isn't writing 57 books. <laughs> well, it is. That's the, I also worry sometimes that it'll stop. And when it stops, I'll stop. But right now it's flowing. It's always a pleasure to have you here. Thank you, know you John. And, and uh, by yeah. all means, uh, yeah. the next, whenever the next Prophet book is, is available, come on back or before that, yeah. anytime. Can we take a picture that I can put on Twitter? Yes, Deepak. We can, <laughs> absolutely. Thank you. I mean, I'm assuming it's, it, well, I know it's at Deepak Chopra, right? Yes. That's where you can find Deepak Chopra on Twitter. His latest book is Muhammad, A Story of the Last Prophet. It's pub published by HarperCollins. Deepak Chopra has been with me here live in Studio Q.